Welcome to the part one of season four of the K KUI International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. I'm Sung Hun Lee from ICU. Today, we have two exciting talks by Caitlin Smith from Johns Hopkins University and Amber Lacey Lubera and Ryan Walter Smith from University of Arizona. Uh, I'm happy to introduce you uh, to our first speaker of uh, today's session. Uh, Dr. Caitlin Smith uh, is a postdoctoral researcher of linguistics at Johns Hopkins University. She received her PhD in linguistics from the University of Southern California. Her research investigates units of representation to provide the best fit to the cross-linguistic phonological patterns by focusing on sub-segmental units of representation known as gesture. So her work uh, uh, focuses on gesture phonology and uh, she has been uh, looking into modifying and expanding established set of gesture parameters and proposing novel types of relations that exist between gestures, as well as developing a phonological grammar that operates over gestural representation. So it's good to have you at the KOIC link today. And uh, uh, today, Caitlin will talk about learning derivationally opaque patterns in the gestural harmony model. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And. We see your uh, title slide. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the learning of some derivationally opaque patterns of vowel height harmony. Okay, so in uh, partial height harmony, uh, just, am I unmuted? Can everyone hear me? I should have. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Um, actually, before I get started, I also want to um, acknowledge my my collaborator, Charlie Perra. Um, Okay, so uh, let's actually get started now. Uh, in, in partial height harmony, um, non-high undergoer vowels uh, raise to approach the height of a high a trigger vowel without necessarily uh, reaching the height of that trigger vowel. So in a language with multiple vowel heights, there are multiple possible patterns that partial raising might follow. One of them is exemplified here by the height harmony of Inzebi, in which the high uh, verbal uh, the high verbal suffix vowel E triggers raising of preceding root vowels. So in this pattern, underlying uh, high mid vowels uh, raise to become high like the trigger vowel, but underlying low mid and low vowels uh, don't become high. So instead, low, uh, low mid vowels become high mid and low vowels become low mid. So they're approaching the trigger's height rather than taking it on completely. Uh, and this illustration of the pattern uh, that I've included on the left uh, makes it clear that what we're dealing with here is a uh, a synchronic chain shift. And chain shifts are interesting because they represent a type of under application opacity. So under application refers to a situation in which a phonological process appears not to have applied when it should have. So when its structural description is met in a surface form. Uh, this is the case with chain shifts. Uh, so if we have a process that maps underlying X to Y and another that maps underlying Y to Z, then we can say that the Y to Z process has under applied to the Y derived from X. This kind of pattern is challenging for constraint-based phonological frameworks like optimality theory and harmonic grammar. Essentially, this difficulty boils down to having no explanation for why an underlying why uh, maps to Z, but a derived why does not, given that these frameworks don't actually have access to uh, the underlying versus derived status of a segment in most of their implementations. But we need some way of generating chain shifts, and in particular, chain shifting height harmony, because this is a well-attested type of pattern. So I've listed here a few examples in addition uh, to Inzebi of some chain shifting vowel raising processes. Another type of logically possible partial height harmony is one in which vowels raise either two steps or not at all, um, potentially giving rise to a saltation. Uh, so in saltatory, raising, um, a vowel raises and skips over one of the heights in the scale, and the vowels at the skip height don't raise. So it looks like they're being you know, uh, jumped over. These types of height harmonies appear to be unattested. So like chain shifts, saltations are a type of under application opacity. Uh, if we have a process that maps X uh, to Y and then maps that derived Y to Z while underlying Y uh, maps faithfully to Y, then we can say that this Y to Z process has under applied to underlying Y. Uh, 
And like chain shifts, saltations present a challenge to optimality theory and harmonic grammar because there's no way uh, in these frameworks to distinguish an underlying and a derived Y and therefore no way to explain why a process applies only to a derived Y. Unlike chain shifts though, saltations are rare among phonological processes generally, and they're apparently unattested in height harmony, or at least so rare that we haven't found any convincing cases of such patterns. So here are kind of the big questions that, that I'm addressing in this talk. As derivationally opaque processes, chain shifts and saltations can't be generated in constraint-based grammars. And if we assume the typical faithfulness constraints of correspondence theory, so especially the featural faithfulness constraint ident. But can we formulate a phonological uh, theory that is capable of generating derivationally opaque patterns? If so, we'll have to contend with the fact that chain shifting and saltatory height harmony are both derivationally opaque, but only chain shifting harmony is well attested. So can we also formulate a phonological theory that predicts robust attestation of chain shifting harmony only to the exclusion of saltatory harmony? I'd like to propose that the answer to both of these questions is yes. And today I'm gonna to be presenting an account of derivationally opaque height harmony that's situated within the gestural harmony model that I've uh, been developing over the last several years in which the subsegmental units of representation are the target-based gestures of articulatory phonology. Uh, in this model, vowel harmony is the result of the extension of a harmony triggering gesture such that it overlaps the gestures of other segments in a word. And partial height harmony is the result of blending between the vowel gestures with different target articulatory states, so in this case, different target heights. What I propose is that the gestural harmony model is able to generate both attested chain shifting height harmony and unattested saltatory harmony, but aspects of the learnability of saltatory height harmony explain its lack of attestation. The idea of uh, the role of phonological learning and learnability and how it interacts with phonological typology is going to be crucial here. There's been a lot of work in recent years suggesting that the patterns that are predicted by phonological frameworks are determined not just by the setup of the grammar, but also by how learnable those patterns are within that framework. So we're going to adopt the assumption uh, today that for a pattern to be robustly attested, it must not only be derivable or generable within a phonological framework, but also easily learnable within that framework. In order to examine the learnability of chain shifts and saltations within the gestural harmony model, we introduce uh, a learning algorithm that we're calling the gestural gradual learning algorithm. This is an error-driven online learning algorithm that we use to model the learning of phonological gestures parameter settings. And we applied it uh, to the learning of those parameter settings that would generate chain shifting and saltatory height harmony. And as we'll see later, the results of our modeling show that the gestural harmony model coupled with the gestural gradual learning algorithm correctly predict that chain shifting harmony should be more learnable and thus better tested than saltatory harmony. We can compare that to the situation in feature-based accounts of these derivationally opaque patterns. So I mentioned before that optimality theory and harmonic grammar can't generate derivationally opaque patterns using the faithfulness constraints of, uh, of correspondence theory. But if we assume some less standard faithfulness constraints, these patterns are generable within these frameworks. And to see how learnable these patterns were, um, we modeled the acquisition of the phonological grammars that derive them using the generational stability model proposed by my collaborator, Charlie O'Hara, in his recent dissertation. Interestingly, these models show that uh, feature frameworks that derive both chain shifting and saltatory height harmonies incorrectly predict uh, saltatory height harmony to be more learnable and therefore better attested than chain shifting harmony. So here's a roadmap of the rest of the talk. Um, I'm gonna start by going over the basics of gestural phonology before moving on to outlining uh, the gestural harmony model. From there, I'll present uh, an analysis of the chain shifting height harmony of Mbebi within that framework. I'll then introduce the gestural gradual learning algorithm and present uh, the results of our computational modeling of the learning of both chain shifting and saltatory height harmony. And then I'll discuss our work on how these derivationally opaque processes can be generated within feature-based phonological frameworks, uh, as well as the results of our learning models for those frameworks. Um, because of time constraints, I'm just going to be giving a very brief summary of this last uh, part of the project, but I've included a couple of appendices with some expanded uh, discussion um, at the end of my set of slides, and I'm happy to go into greater detail after the talk and also to, to take questions about it. Uh, but first things first, uh, let's start with an overview of the gesture as a unit of phonological representation. Okay, 
Uh, so gestures are, are goal-based units. So they're specified for a target articulatory state. So open uh, velum, protruded lips. Here, we're looking at an example of a gesture with a goal of alveolar closure that would be used in the representation of an alveolar stop. The achievement of this gesture's target articulatory state unfolds over time according to a dynamically defined equation of motion that's represented by this gradually climbing line within the box. The length of time over which the gesture commands the vocal tract to achieve its target state is its activation period, and that's represented by the box's horizontal length. So the x-axis represents time in, in these gestural representations. Um, when sufficient time has passed for this goal to be achieved, the gesture deactivates and its articulators can return to specified uh, neutral positions. That's what this, this gradually falling line here is. Um, and each gesture is specified for several uh, parameters um, that determine like sort of how and when this, uh, this, uh, cl this closure uh, target uh, is reached. Okay, so a gesture's target articulatory state is specified in terms of constriction, location, and constriction degree. The constriction location consonantal gesture is specified at some specific point along the static surface of the vocal tract, so the palate, the uvula, et cetera. And a constriction degree refers to how, uh, how wide or narrow the constriction at that point is. So closed for stop, critically narrow for fricative, et cetera. I'm assuming something just a little bit different for vowels. So if you're already familiar with gestural representations, um, I'm diverging a bit from how vowels are usually represented within articulatory phonology. Uh, so here, like consonantal gestures, vocalic gestures are still going to be specified for constriction, location, and degree, but rather than specifying a specific point along the vocal tract and proposing the vowels are composed of two tongue body gestures that are specified for fairly wide regions of the vocal tract. So one of these gestures has a constriction location that I'm just calling upper surface that includes most of the, the palate and helium, and the target articulatory state of this gesture is to make a constriction anywhere in this region. This uh, uh, for this gesture, uh, the, the constriction degree will determine uh, a vowel's height. So a narrow constriction at the upper surface produces a high vowel, a wide constriction produces a low vowel. The other vowel gesture I'm assuming uh, has a constriction location that I'm uh, just calling back surface uh, that includes the velum slash uvula and the pharynx. Uh, the constriction degree of a tongue body back surface gesture will determine a vowel's uh, backness. So a narrow constriction produces a back vowel, a wide constriction produces a front vowel. In addition uh, to the parameters that describe the production of uh, a gesture's target articulation, there are a couple of additional gesture parameters that are going to be important in today's talk. Um, so each gesture has a specified blending strength, which determines the outcome of intergestural competition. We'll talk about that more in just a second. And in previous work, I've uh, proposed that a gesture is specified as to whether or not it self-activates at its specified starting point and whether it self-deactivates once it reaches its target articulatory state. These, these two parameters here that I've listed um, at the bottom of this slide are the parameters that determine whether or not a gesture is a trigger of harmony. In gestural uh, phonology, forms are often displayed in a gestural score like the one you see here. So again, time is represented on the x-axis. Um, here I've given a, a slightly idealized gestural score for the word pen. The familiar segmental transcriptions at the top um, and the subscripts for each segment match the subscripts of the gestures that they're composed of. One thing you'll notice uh, in this gestural score is that gestures are often substantially overlap each other in time and when they do, we often make conflicting demands of vocal tract articulators. We can see a clear example of, of conflict between temporally overlapped gestures in the VCV sequence like aga that I've provided here. We can see that throughout the VCV sequence, the vocalic gestures uh, for the ahs require the tongue to be central or back and uh, low, while during the production of the ga, the tongue is required to, to make a closure of the velum. And this means that during the period in which the gestures of both ah and ga are active, um, this period here, their target articul articulatory states are in competition with one another. So both target states uh, can't be perfectly attained at the same time. So we say that these gestures are antagonistic to one another. Uh, according to the task dynamic model of speech production, when gestural antagonism occurs, it's resolved by blending the competing target states of these gestures to create an intermediate target state that holds during the period of their concurrent activation. 
uh, this blended target state is the, the weighted average of the two gestures individual target articulatory states. And the weighting in this averaging function is contributed by the gestures blending strength uh, parameters, which are denoted by alpha. So returning to our August sequence, this means that during the period in which the antagonistic gestures of both ah uh, and ga are active, gestural blending occurs to resolve the competition uh, between them. So if the ah is of a particularly high strength, its target will be favored by gestural blending and the vocal track will take on this posture in red. On the other hand, if the ga is of a higher strength, its target will be favored by gestural blending um, and the vocal track will take on the posture in blue. And if their blending strengths are roughly equal, we'll see the vocal tract take on an intermediate posture like this one shown in purple. Um, in uh, the real world case of gestural blending in a VCV sequence, we expect to see something most closely resembling uh, the blue outcome. So a consonantal gesture that's stronger than the vowel gesture. Um, keep that in mind for later. Okay, so now that we have a grasp on how to use gestures to represent words, we can move on to how to use gestures to represent vowel harmony with, within the gestural harmony model. Okay, so here I'm showing you several types of gestures that are assumed in the gestural harmony model. The top gesture is a typical self-activating, self-deactivating lip protrusion gesture that would be used uh, to represent rounding. When it reaches its target articulatory state, uh, it self-deactivates. Uh, the gesture below it is a persistent or non-self-deactivating gesture. Uh, the dashed line here uh, indicates the point at which the gesture reaches its target articulatory state, but doesn't deactivate. Instead, it remains active, extending and overlapping the gestures of following segment. The bottom gesture is an anticipatory or early activating gesture. So the dashed line here indicates the point which the gesture is scheduled uh, to start according to its position in a word. But since it's an anticipatory gesture, it's, achieved, it's activated uh, before that point. Uh, so extending to overlap the gestures of preceding segments. So in this model, harmony arises when a segment includes a gesture that's either persistent, anticipatory, or both. Uh, so that segment is the trigger of harmony. Other segments undergo harmony when their composite gestures are overlapped by a harmony triggering gesture. So this is a quick example of how to gesturally represent rounding harmony. This is a gestural score for an OO sequence. So remember, time is on the x-axis. Um, so a persistent uh, lip protrusion gesture, that's this blue guy here, overlaps the gestures of the following vowel. And so this second vowel surfaces as rounded. Uh, we see in the time course of lip protrusion below the gestural score that the lips reach their target state, uh, protruded, and remain there throughout the word. And this is the basic representation of harmony within this model, so a single uninterrupted harmonizing gesture. But sometimes segments appear to have been skipped over by a harmony process, and we refer to these segments as being transparent to harmony. To account uh, for transparency, this model takes advantage of the fact that gestures are goal-based units, so they can be specified for a target articulatory state without necessarily achieving it successfully. Uh, one of the major innovations of this model of harmony is that transparent segments are a special type of undergoer and that transparency is the result of blending two gestures that are antagonistic to one another, just like we saw in the Aga sequence earlier. So remember, gestural antagonism refers to a situation in which two concurrently active gestures have opposing target articulatory states. Uh, so here I've provided a schematic of how gestural antagonism can result in transparency to harmony. We have a harmonizing gesture that spans an entire word and another gesture that's active for some shorter period of time uh, within that. These gestures are antagonistic to one another. They have conflicting target states, so they compete with one another. Um, and I've shown an abstract time course for some uh, you know, abstract vocal tract variable, showing that this competition has favored the target of the antagonistic gesture in blue rather than the harmonizing gesture in tan. And this is due to the gestures uh, respective strength parameter values. Okay, so this is the gestural score for an OEO sequence in which the E is transparent to rounding harmony. Um, so an extended duration um, of persistent lip protrusion gesture overlaps the gestures of uh, all the following vowels. Uh, the third vowel in the sequence surfaces is rounded during, due to this overlap. But the high front E, which is also overlapped by the lip protrusion gesture, uh, surfaces as unrounded. And this is because the representation of E includes an antagonistic lip spreading gesture, which, which is specified for a high gestural strength. 
um, allowing it to counteract the effect of the harmonizing lip protrusion gesture, but only during this period here where they're concurrently active. Okay. So this outcome is dependent on the strength of the transparent lip spreading gesture being much greater than that of a harmonizing uh, lip protrusion gesture. So I provided an example with like a 10 to one strength ratio, for instance. But there's, there's no guarantee within this model that within a given pair of overlap gestures, one is going to be strong and one is going to be weak. Um, another possible scenario is one in which a harmonizing gesture and an overlapped antagonistic gesture have similar or identical strengths as I've shown here. Uh, and when this occurs, the prediction is that we would have a case of blending resulting in partial transparency and partial undergoing of harmony. And that's just what we need for our analysis of the chain shifting partial height, partial height harmony of Inzebi. Okay. So here's a reminder of the, the data we're accounting for in which the high vowel E in a suffix causes raising of preceding stem vowels. This is a case of partial chain shifting vowel raising harmony in which uh, low and low mid vowels uh, only partially assimilate to the height of the trigger of harmony. And this partial assimilation can be analyzed as a result of the blending of antagonistic vowel gestures. The four vowel heights observed in Nzebi can be re represented by each vowel, including an upper surface gesture with one of four possible target constriction degrees. So narrow, narrow, mid, wide, mid, and wide. I've also provided these vowel heights with just slightly idealized numerical values. And I analyzed the vowel harmony in Nzebi as the result of overlap by an anticipatory upper surface uh, vowel gesture with a narrow constriction degree. It's part of the representation of the suffix high vowel E. Um, and what's important to note here is that um, all vocalic upper surface gestures that are specified for any constriction degree um, other, um, other than narrow are antagonistic to this harmonizing gesture. So which means that when they're overlapped by it, gestural blending occurs. Um, and we can see several different outcomes of blending in this time course of tongue body height here. These outcomes of blending will depend not only on the vowel gestures, different target constriction degrees, but also on their different strength parameter values. Um, so I've also provided these vowels with some hand-picked strength values. Uh, for those, keep in mind that it's the strength ratios between the gestures that matter and not the precise strength values that I've provided here. Uh, so the high mid vowels uh, surface is high rather than resisting raising, and that suggests that they have a blending strength that's lower than the true ease gestural strength. So they'll surface as full undergoers um, when they're overlapped. But the vowels specified for wide and wide mid constrictions that only partially undergo this vowel raising harmony are able to partially resist the raising effect of the triggering narrow gesture. The wide uh, mid vowels raise to only an intermediate degree when they're overlapped by E, and that suggests that E and A are of roughly equal blending strength as the triggering high vowel. And the wide vowel A is proposed to have an even greater gestural strength, allowing it to resist raising for the most part. So surfacing is E when overlapped by the gesture of E. Okay, so let's see this uh, analysis in action. Okay, I mentioned that by specifying narrow mid vowels A and O, um, to have um, a much lower blending strength, something like just a 10th the strength of high vowels, gestural blending is going to result in a blended target state that's very similar to that of the harmony trigger, so within half a millimeter. As a result, uh, A and O fully undergo harmony and these surfaces raised, as we can see uh, for this gestural score and the resulting uh, time course of tongue body height here. Wide mid vowels, on the other hand, resist fully undergoing harmony, but they also don't surface uh, as fully transparent to harmony. Um, this partial undergoing is, is generated by providing the high trigger E and the low mid undergoers at an, uh, all equal strengths. So the blending function doesn't favor either target articulatory state over the other, but instead returns a target constriction degree that's intermediate between the two and uh, consistent with the target constriction degree of the underlying high mid vowels. Uh, so this uh, this uh, gesture overlapped by E produces something like E. Uh. And finally, wide vowels also resist fully undergoing harmony. And uh, in surface of the wide mid constriction degree that's closer to A uh, than it is to E. Uh, so something like E. Uh. And this is generated by providing A uh, with twice the blending strength of E, um, as we can see. Uh, in this, this blending function here. Uh, so the blending function returns a target constriction degree consistent with uh, that of E, um, as we can see um, 
uh, from the spunning function and also from this, this time course of tongue body height here. Okay. So the gestural harmony model provides a successful account of chain shifting height harmony in Nzebi. And this success arises because we're able to use gestural blending to produce the effect of vowel raising, but the individual gestures of each vowel are still present and unaltered in the gestural score. And what this means is that while an underlying A, for instance, and an A derived by blending may be articulatorily and acoustically uh, similar or even identical, um, their gestural makeups are different as we can see here. So despite the height harmony of Nzebi looking like a chain shift in this gestural model of height harmony, apparently chain shifting raising is actually modeled as a derivationally transparent uh, pattern. And this is a really nice result because we can avoid the, uh, the difficulties in generating a synchronic chain shift in optimality theory or a harmonic grammar. So what about our other derivationally opaque pattern, saltation? Uh, well, this model can also generate unattested saltatory height harmony, like the one I've shown here, um, provided that gestures are permitted to take on some pretty extreme strength values. So here I've provided some hand-picked strengths that'll produce something pr pretty close uh, to the raising pattern indicated by the arrows. But why does saltation require such extreme blending strengths? Uh, so to understand this, we introduce the idea of overpowering relationships between blended gestures in which one gesture strength is one step greater along some ex exponential scale. So producing either full assimilation or full resistance to assimilation. Okay. So to produce assimilation of a segment X to a segment Y, the blending strength of Y's gesture must be exponentially greater than that of X, so say 10 times more. Uh, but for a segment Z to resist assimilation to Y, the blending strength of Z's gesture must be exponentially greater than that of Y. So we end up uh, with a chain of overpowering relations like the one we see here, um, in which strength uh, increases exponentially among these, these overpowering uh, relations, among these gestures in overpowering relations, excuse me. Uh, we saw in our analysis of chain shifting height harmony in, in Zebi that only one overpowering relation is necessary to drive the pattern. So high mid vowels fully assimilate to high vowels, so high vowels must overpower high mid vowels. But two step uh, saltatory height harmony requires two overpowering relations among vowels. The high mid vowels must fully resist raising, so they must overpower the high vowels. Uh, and low mid vowels fully assimilate to the high vowels, so high, high vowels must overpower the low mid vowels. These differences in the number of links and these chains of overpowering relations between gestures of different vowel heights affect how strong the strongest gestures need to be in order to generate a given raising uh, pattern. And we'll see that this difference in the extremeness of the gestural strength necessary to generate chain shifting and saltatory height harmony, um, this difference has important consequences for the relative learnability of these patterns. And that's the subject of this next uh, section. I mentioned at the outset that there's been increasing attention paid to the role of the relative learnability of phonological patterns in affecting how typologically frequent they are. So broadly, a pattern that's more difficult to learn is more likely to be mislearned and therefore more likely to change across generations and therefore become typologically under or even unattested. What we're going to show in this section is that assuming a gestural phonological framework, saltatory height harmony requires much more data to be correctly learned than chain shifting harmony. So even if a case of saltatory harmony uh, developed, it would be far more likely to change across generations and even disappear completely. In order to test the learnability of our derivationally opaque uh, height harmony patterns in the gestural harmony model, my collaborator, Charlie O'Hara and I developed the gestural gradual learning algorithm. This is an error-driven online lear learning algorithm that we use to model the learning of phonological representations. So in this case, uh, gestural parameters. We assume the learner already has knowledge that high vowels trigger raising of preceding vowels via overlap. So it doesn't need to learn whether or when to produce harmony. Instead, the goal of this algorithm is to set the constriction degree targets and strengths of the learner's gestures so that the learner's raising pattern arise, arises from, um, sorry, the, the learner's raising pattern arising from gestural overlap replicates its teachers. Uh, so here's the learning algorithm and it's a bit of a wall of text. So I'm just gonna walk you through it really quickly. Um, so on each uh, training iteration, we randomly generate a CV or a VCV sequence. 
if V2 is a trigger of harmony, the learner knows that it overlaps V1 and that they're blended. And if the consonant is a dorsal G, then it's also blended with V2. So just like the aga sequence that I showed you earlier. If the learner produces an error, so like if it produces a constriction degree outside of a set window, uh, then the learner's gestural parameters are updated. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through a couple of example learning trials to illustrate those updates. Um, it's a little easier than reading them. Um, so in this example, the learner is attempting to produce underlying abi, which should surface as ebi due to height harmony. But when we compare it with the teacher's production of ebi, um, we can see that the learner produced it with a V1 that's a bit too wide. Since the first vowel um, was produced with too wide a constriction degree, and since blending of two gestures was involved in this error, a few updates occur. Uh, so the learner updates the constriction targets of both the A and the E to be slightly narrower. And it also updates their strengths. So the A is slightly weakened and E is slightly strengthened. Um, not all of these updates actually bring the learner's gestural parameter settings closer to the teacher's settings, but all of these updates will ensure that on the next trial in which A blends with E, the outcome will be a narrower constriction. Right. So in this example, the learner is attempting uh, to produce underlying ega, which should surface as ega. Uh, but when we compare it with the teacher's production, um, we can see that the learner produces it with a V1 that's a bit too high or a bit too narrow, um, and a dorsal approximate uh, rather than a stop. Since the first vowel uh, e was produced with too narrow a constriction degree, the learner updates its constriction target to be slightly wider. This gesture isn't blended with anything, so its blending strength value is not updated. And since the G was produced with too wide of a constriction degree, some additional updates are necessary there. So the G and A uh, gestures are blended with one another. So the learner updates their constriction degree targets to be narrower and their blending strength so that uh, G gets stronger and A gets weaker. Okay, so that's how the algorithm works. These are the patterns we tested it on. Uh, one is a chain shifting height harmony triggered by high vowels, so similar to what we saw in Nzebi earlier. And the other is an unattested harmony process in which vowels raise either two steps along the height scale or not at all, uh, resulting in saltation of uh, the low mid vowels over the high mid vowels. Uh, we ran 100 learning models for each of these types of harmony. Okay, so let's look at some results. First, all of our models learned to correctly produce the patterns they were tasked with learning. And they did so by setting gestural parameter values pretty close to the handpicked values I showed you earlier for chain shifting and saltatory harmony. Here are the average learned blending strengths and tongue body constriction degrees for all of the vowels and the dorsal consonant G for the models trained on the chain shifting height harmony. Uh, the vowel constriction degrees are pretty close to the heights of uh, 4, 8, 12, and 16 um, of the teacher's production. And the G correctly set its constriction degree uh, to negative two, which is a standard value used for stops in articulatory phonology. And the blending strengths are also similar to those we used in the analysis of Nzebi. So uh, weak high mid vowels, which are overpowered by high vowels, which are matched by low mid vowels and doubled by the low vowel. And we also see that the G took on a much higher blending strength in order to overpower the strongest vowel in the inventory and not surface as an approximant. And here are the average learned uh, blending strengths and tongue body constriction degrees for all of the segments in the models trained on the saltatory height harmony. So again, the vowel constriction degrees are pretty close to the 4, 8, 12, and 16 of the teacher's production. And the blending strengths are similar to those that I provided for the hypothetical case of saltatory height harmony earlier. They're actually even more extreme than what I provided, but they do follow the same basic pattern of overpowering relations. So we have uh, weak low mid vowels overpowered by high vowels, which are overpowered by the high mid vowels. And this low vowel A uh, takes on about half the strength of the high vowels. And again, we see a really high strength for dorsal G and it needs to overpower the strongest vowel in the inventory. In this case, that sends its strength skyrocketing. And what we found is that these extreme strength values had a pretty profound impact on how many training iterations it, it, it took to learn each of these patterns. The plot on the right graphs the uh, average number of iterations necessary for the learner to converge upon a target pattern. Uh, we see that saltatory height harmony takes over five times the amount of training data to learn correctly compared to chain shifting height harmony. Uh, 
this difference in learning rate makes the saltatory pattern more likely to be mislearned across generations. And we claim that this causes it to become less typologically frequent. We can see that the learning of strength values is at the root of this result by looking at our learning trajectories for blending strength values. So here are the average trajectories of learned strengths for each of the vowel heights and the consonant G in learners tasked with producing a uh, chain shifting height harmony. We see uh, the high mid, uh, the strength of the high mid vowels dive down to one and stay there. And then high and low mid vowels climb quickly at the beginning and then they sort of plateau uh, while the strongest vowel, uh, the low A, ah, um, keeps climbing for a, a bit longer. Oh, sorry, this is ah here. Um, and we see that G, the segment with the most extreme gestural blending strength takes the longest time to set its blending strength value. Okay, so now we'll look at saltatory height harmony. Um, at the number of iterations at which chain shifting harmony has already been learned, so that's this, uh, this red line here. This is the number of iterations where chain shifting harmony has, has learned it's, these models have converged. Um, we can see that the blending strengths of segments in the saltatory height uh, harmony simulations are still being set and they're actually not even particularly close uh, to, to being done, uh, being learned. So the extremeness of the strengths necessary uh, to derive a pattern has an effect on learning rate for these patterns. And we think a couple of factors are at play here. Um, so one is that more extreme strengths just take longer to get to um, with a, a linear update rule like we have in the, uh, the gestural uh, gradual learning algorithm. Um, the other factor we think is at play is that learning more strength ratios and ratios involving more extreme values involve making more incorrect updates to blending parameters. So more total updates are necessary to reach gestures correct blending values. And we can tie all of this back to the number of overpowering relationships between blended gestures that are necessary to produce each pattern. Saltatory harmony requires three overpowering relationships between the segments listed here, while chain shifting harmony requires only two. Um, the more overpowering relationships are necessary to generate a pattern, the more extreme strengths are necessary. So more gestural parameter updates must occur during the learning process for saltatory har height harmony, making learning require many more training items and much more time relative to the learning of chain shifting harmony. Okay, so summarizing this part, gestural harmony model generates both chain shifting and saltatory height harmony. Um, but our learning models based on the gestural gradual learning algorithm show that chain shifting harmony is easier or faster to learn. Um, and if we, if we subscribe to the idea that learnability affects typology, um, this means that patterns that are easier to learn, like chain shifting height harmony, are predicted to be more robustly attested cross linguistically, which is just what we find in the case of, of these derivationally opaque height harmony patterns. I want to close out the talk by comparing our results to the results we get from modeling learning of these derivationally opaque patterns in featural frameworks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have time to go into great detail here, but there's a much more detailed set of slides on this part of the project in some appendices. Um, okay, so at, at this point, it's fairly, I guess, somewhat well-known uh, property of harmonic grammar that when we assume the faithfulness constraints of correspondence theory, constraints like a dent on uh, feature changes, we can't generate either chain shifts or saltations. Uh, so for chain shifts, we have this intuition that each mapping in the pattern can be a little unfaithful, but not too unfaithful. Uh, but trying to generate gang effects among faithfulness constraints uh, fails. For saltations, the intuition is that a mapping can be very unfaithful as long as it resolves some markedness violation, um, like with disharmony. Um, but an output can't be a little unfaithful and also marked. Uh, but trying to generate gang effects among a faithfulness constraint and a markedness constraint also fails. Uh, work by Tesser and Magri shows uh, that it's ac actually properties of individual faithfulness constraints that matter in the genera generation of cases of under application opacity, uh, not constraint interaction. For a constraint like a dent, the number of violations incurred by a less faithful mapping are. Um, exactly those incurred by its more faithful component mappings. So the mapping X to Z skipping over Y incurs exactly the same violations as the mappings X to Y 
and Y to Z combined. But to generate a chain shift, what we need is the constraint C that penalizes an extra unfaithful mapping more than its component, more faithful mappings. We want to uh, prevent these, these more unfaithful mappings. And to generate a saltation, we need a constraint S that penalizes an extra unfaithful mapping less than its component, more faithful mappings. So we need a different type of faithfulness constraint in order to derive chain shifts and saltations. And there are a couple of proposals of note that fit this bill. One proposal comes from Nana Desikin that feature values are scalar and the faithfulness constraints that operate over them are either scalar or categorical. And another proposal is that every input output mapping is subject to its own distinct faithfulness constraint from the star map family. And I don't have time to discuss how each of these approaches works, but I'm happy to address it during the question period. Uh, what I do want to discuss is that we tested the learnability of these two approaches to deriving chain shifting and saltatory height harmony using the generational stability model developed by my collaborator, by Charlie O'Hara. This is an error-driven learner of constraint weightings in uh, maximum entropy or max -cent harmonic grammar. This is a prob probabilistic version of harmonic grammar. Um, and this is an iterated learning model, which means that a learner is trained on a pattern provided by a teacher, and then that learner matures and becomes the teacher for a new learner uh, of the next generation. And this process is iterated through some number of generations. This kind of iterated learning model um, uh, models the transmissibility of phonological patterns. And we can interpret greater cross-generational stability of a pattern as predicting that a pattern should be more robustly attested. So we conducted several sets of simulations using this learning model. Uh, we simulated learning using the constraint set from feature scale theory, as well as the constraint set utilizing distinct faithfulness constraints from the star map family for each input output mapping. Um, and for the distinct faithfulness simulations, we also ran simulations with three different sets of initial constraint weightings. Uh, feel free to ask me why. Um, and for all of these constraint sets and initial weighting conditions, we simulated the learning of both chain shifting and saltatory height harmony. So 100 simulations per pattern type, per constraint set, per initial weighting condition. Um, at each generation, a learner went through 2,000 learning trials, and each simulation went on for 10 generations. We'll look at the results of the scalar and the categorical faithfulness simulations first. Uh, what we see is that the cross-generational stability of uh, chain-shifting height harmony is actually less than that of saltatory height harmony. Saltatory height harmony was stable in the vast majority of the simulations, uh, whereas the chain shifting harmony changed uh, to a different type of harmony pattern by the end of the simulation about a third of the time. And we see something really similar for our distinct faithfulness uh, simulations. Regardless of initial weighting condition, chain shifting harmony is never more stable across generations than saltatory height harmony. And in fact, for one of our initial weighting conditions, uh, chain shifting harmony was much less stable and saltatory harmony. Okay, so we've looked at two different uh, feature-based approaches to generating under application opacity in harmonic grammar. But when we look at the learnability of these patterns and these frameworks, we see that both um, incorrectly predict that uh, saltatory height harmony is either as easy or easier to learn, and therefore more stably transmitted across generations relative to chain shifting harmony. And this predicts that saltatory harmony should be more widely attested cross-linguistically than chain shifting harmony, contra what we see in real world typology and contra what we found in our gesture-based learning simulations. Okay, uh, so to sum up, um, I've walked you through the gestural harmony model um, and shown that it's sufficiently powerful to generate apparently derivationally opaque chain shifting and saltatory height harmony patterns. Featural frameworks that eschew correspondence theory-based faithfulness uh, constraints are also powerful enough to generate these opaque uh, chain shifts and saltations. Uh, so from here, we turn to learning results. The results of our learning simulations using the gestural gradual learning algorithm correctly indicate a typological bias favoring attested chain shifting harmony and against saltatory, saltatory harmony. Um, while the results of our learning simulations in featural frameworks incorrectly indicate a bias favoring saltatory harmony and against chain shifting harmony. And uh, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so 
If you have uh, questions and or comments, please send me your name and affiliation. So the first question will come from Shigeto Kawahara at Keio University. Well, thanks, Caitlin. This was really nice. I, I, I learned a lot. I have a Great, comment good. and a question. One is okay. that essentially your analysis is treating the chain shift as coalescence. Is that right? Like blending um, the clusters. Yeah, I guess you could think of it that way. Yeah, sure. East gesture extending to the preceding vowel and this call. Yeah. So I was wondering if your analysis can easily be extended to cases of real coalescence because, well, I've tried to analyze vowel coalescence and it's really complicated to do that in a standard optimality theory framework. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't actually thought about, about you know, standard cases of coalescence, but I think it could be extended in that direction fairly uh, straightforwardly. Um, really all you would need is for the, the phonological grammar to produce the overlap and then the, the gestural blending would sort of take care of, of what the, over, the outcome of that overlap would be. Yeah. Right. So because if you're, you know, if you're analyzing uh, E becoming A, then Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you be faithful to lowness or highness and, you know, take the middle ground? Really yeah, yeah. So, right. All of that would be would be taken care of by by the, the blending parameter values as opposed to the grammar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was that was more like a comment. Uh, my, my, my question is, um, so you have different strength values, right? Mm -hmm. It has to be really strong. Um, can you derive that kind of difference between consonants and vowels and the strength values of different vowels? Yeah, so so let me maybe restate your question to make sure that you're that, that I'm understanding it correctly. Um, so it, it is the question something like um, whether whether we can uh, say that, these strength values are, are maybe somewhat predictable from exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. other Can qualities. Yeah. Like yeah. So I, I think somewhat. Um, so what we seem to, to find over and over, um, you know, looking, looking at patterns where, where gestural blending seems to be, um, seem to be playing a role, not just harmony patterns, but phonological patterns in general, we see it very often. Um, that like E wants to be a strong vowel. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be something like, um, I, I haven't thought much about how to sort of build that into the theory. It's not something that's predicted by the theory, but it's something that we observe. Um, I think there's also something about uh, peripherality. So um, in a lot of harmony patterns that I've looked at, what we seem to see is things like high vowels and low vowels want to be the, the strongest. And that doesn't seem like an accident. Um, so yeah, I think that there, there's a need to be able to, to specify um, vowel strengths as opposed to letting them be purely emergent, but there does seem to be something emergent about them. Um, and I think we need to, to think more about how to how to maybe build those biases into the theory because they're, they're not there currently. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, due to the time constraint, we, because we have the another talk, uh, we will continue the question and answer in the breakout room. Uh, would that be okay, okay Hitley? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so now the recording uh, should stop.